Human languages never stop changing. You know that if you've ever read works of literature from centuries ago. But written records provide a frustratingly incomplete picture of the evolution of language. So how can linguists figure out which sounds and grammatical structures stay in a language for millennia, and which ones are more short-lived, showing up in one historical period and disappearing in the next? It turns out that math offers some powerful tools that researchers are now using to study the past and future of languages. Welcome to another mathematical moment from the American Mathematical Society. I'm Scott Hirschberger. Today we're talking with Tobias Gala, a professor of theoretical physics, and Ricardo Bermudez Otero, a senior lecturer in linguistics and English language. Both of them are at the University of Manchester, and they're part of an interdisciplinary collaboration using math to reveal how languages change over time. So welcome to you both. Um, and Ricardo, I'd like to start with you. Um, before we get too much into the details of your research, can you just give us a quick example of a language feature that we already know is rapidly changing over time and one that's more slowly changing? Okay. Um, the two examples that we've been using uh, repeatedly is um, the order of the object and the verb in a clause in a sentence, such as, for instance, um, in English you say, um, uh, the boy loves the girl, but in Latin, um, the the girl goes before the verb. You say uh, puer puelam amat. Um, so that's uh, one of uh, the features um, that I want to use, and that changes relatively slowly. So um, it is possible for a language to change from the verb, uh, sorry, from the object verb to the verb object order. And actually that happened in the history of English. If you go all the way back to um, uh, Old English, you see many sentences where the object goes before the verb rather than after. So that's a change that is possible, but it happens rarely. So if a language has the um, uh, object verb order, it's likely to get uh, stuck with it for a long period of time. Uh, in contrast, um, a feature that changes more often is whether the language has um, words or suffixes like present-day English, the, the definite article, as in the boy. Um, you will have noticed that when I gave the Latin translation of that, I said puer puelam uh, amat, which glossed word by word is boy, girl, loves. And there is nothing there corresponding to the definite article of English. Now, again, uh, languages uh, can get definite articles like the and lose them. And that seems to happen a lot more often, um, much more rapidly than, um, than changes in the order of the verb and the object. Okay, very cool. And when we talk about these changes being rapid or slow, what sort of timescale are we talking about? When I use the word rapid, I was probably misrepresenting the situation in that what we're really interested in is how often it happens. Uh, but this raises an interesting technical question, which is you might think um, that uh, the best way of measuring this is to say, well, how often does this happen on average in if you take a sample of languages and you say in a period of a thousand years, how how often does this happen? But that's actually how we it's not how we um, uh, went about measuring uh, the difference between uh, the rate of change in uh, verbs and objects and uh, the rate of change in definite articles. Um, actually, how we define these, um, this uh, difference is in terms of um, how many times the feature is passed down in history um, incorrectly, i.e. there is a change relative to the number of times where it is passed correctly. So um, we express this as a ratio of um, uh, unfaithful to faithful transmission of the feature rather than as number of changes per unit of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so Tobias, what got you as a physicist interested in using the models that you've worked with and math to, to study language change? 
Well, th so this is not that uncommon as one may think. So I, I work in this area of complexity science where we use models from physics and maths uh, actually for a number of topics. And I had worked with biologists, say, and also other social scientists. So and I, I believe the initial contact came from um, Ricardo's student at the time, Henry Kauhanen, who was the, the first author of the paper. And they emailed me and it sounded interesting and then we started talking and then over you know a period of time this this work sort of emerged from this but initially it was just curiosity i guess okay cool um and ricardo there are two main types of language change that you talk about um in your paper that come into play in your model and so you talk about horizontal changes and vertical changes so can you explain brief briefly what the difference is between those two types and why they're both important. Okay, okay. So it's probably best to start with uh, the vertical dimension and change in the vertical dimension. Um, with that term, we refer to, refer to the fact that for, for a language to be passed down historically, um, new generations of uh, children uh, need to be brought up uh, uh, speaking the language as the native language. Um, so that is the transmission of children from the caregivers, uh, typically uh, the parents and, and the adults around them when they're little, to, um, to children. Uh, that's first language acquisition by children. And uh, first language acquisition by children um, is what uh, transmits language in the vertical uh, direction. Uh, but of course, uh, language is not just passed down from uh, native speakers to children who then become native speakers. Um, but you yourself, uh, you were saying uh, before, uh, had studied um, uh, Spanish um, at, uh, at university as, um, as an adult, and you're a second, uh, for you, Spanish is a second or perhaps third language? Second language, yeah. Second language. So you are a very good example of what we call an L2 speaker, a, a speaker of a, a language that is not your late native language and that um, you have acquired um, non-natively as an adult. Um, that is just one type of uh, transmission of language of um, that goes under the general banner of horizontal. Uh, this ref uh, horizontal transmission, so this refers to all types of um, uh, contact phenomena when uh, speakers uh, that have different native languages come into contact. So one possibility is that, is that um, uh, you acquire a second language non-natively uh, through formal education, but it can also be that uh, you live in a country near the border with another country where there are, um, another language is spoken, so you acquire your first language natively, but through frequent interaction with people um, from the other country across the border, you pick up um, uh, uh, a second language, an L2, uh, and that would be another example of horizontal transmission. Got it. Okay. And so then how do you kind of encapsulate these complex processes into a mathematical model that you're able to work with and, and do some calculations with? So Ricardo had a, a, a very talented student at the time, Henry Kauhanen, who is also mathematically trained and, and a student of linguistics. And he, I think, came up with a model which essentially models languages as um, the, the units of the model and then each then you, you focus on one particular feature of, of languages um, like the ones that, that Ricardo described so um, and then you say each language can either have or not have this feature in, in a simple setting and then you have your your languages on a, on a map and each language either has or doesn't have the feature and then that can change over time so in the vertical process a language can sort of spontaneously um, lose the feature or, or develop it or features can be copied from neighboring languages and, and errors can happen in that copying process and then you you write this down when you're sort of the, with the appropriate training in maths or physics you you then think in terms of a computer simulation maybe at first and say well how would i simulate this and from that then you develop a, a mathematical model for this for these processes okay cool and so then the one of the connections to physics comes from the 
number that you get out of this model, which you call a sort of linguistic temperature. So can you talk a little bit about what that is and what that represents? So in this, yeah, so we sort of did the, did the analysis of the model and then we sort of stumbled across temperature in, in a way um, as, a, as a parameter or, or quantity that emerges from the model and it sort of describes how, um, how often errors happen in these vertical and horizontal processes. So every time um, languages are passed on or features are passed on, errors can happen vertically um, or, or horizontally. And then you ask yourself, how often does this happen? So in what percentage of copying events, for example, lead, lead to an error? And this quantity temperature that we um, found sort of encapsulates that. And it's a bit analogous to temperature in physics. The analogy goes a, sort of some distance, but not, 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 there's also limits. But um, if you think of a, a, a gas, a high temperature substance, um, then the particles sort of move around and about sort of randomly. And at lower temperatures, they're sort of frozen. And in, in ice, for example, there's a regular structure. And it's a bit like this. If you look at these languages on a map, um, if, if there's a high temperature, or a feature has high temperature, the features sort of come and go. They're sometimes there, sometimes not there. Languages lose them, they copy them, but with errors, and they, it's sort of random, a random assembly. And a feature with a low temperature would have some larger degree of order in there like an ice crystal um, in, in physics. So that's, that's the connection. It, it characterizes the amount of, of order in the spatial arrangement uh, of features. Uh, here as a linguist, I, I'd like to put in a word for, for the power of mathematics, because um, the concept of temperature as, uh, as we've developed it is not one that existed in, in linguistics before. And, and we really were guided to it by the, by the mathematics. So the, the languages uh, are actually just the abstract squares in this, in this lattice. Um, and, um, and the model initially, uh, it, and it has remained uh, very simple. Uh, a cell can either flip from having a feature to not having it or vice versa. That's the vertical process, or it can copy uh, a feature from a from a neighboring cell faithfully or unfaithfully so um, what happened is that as we worked on the on the model we found that uh, uh, empirical estimates of of temperature uh, driven by by um, uh, data from linguistic atlases were actually astonishingly good they um, converged with the results of much more complicated uh, models that use a lot more, more information than we did. Um, and in some cases, they worked even better. So it was really puzzling for us to, to try and understand why such a simple abstract model worked so well. Uh, so we, we, we did a lot of head scratching trying to, to understand what it was in the dynamics of the model that enabled it to um, capture so well uh, the relative rates of, of change of features in actual languages in the actual world. And it was reflecting on that, um, on that question that led us to understand, ah, what really the key measure or parameter that we're interested in here um, is, is the ratio of uh, faithful to unfaithful uh, transmission events, whether in the horizontal or the vertical dimension. So how many times the feature is passed on correctly, how many times it is passed on incorrectly, whether vertically or horizontally. Um, and that is what we call temperature. Now, that is a different way of thinking about it from the way that linguists had been looking at it before, because linguists before uh, tended to isolate the vertical from the horizontal dimension. They, they typically thought of contact, the horizontal dimension, as noise that had to be controlled for. Uh, and they were interested in just in the vertical dimension. How often do children learn something that is different from what the parents uh, uh, speak? And that raises really difficult challenges. What the model actually showed is that um, what's really important is the ratio of faithful unfaithful to faithful transmission in either dimension. That's what we call temperature, but we were guided to it by the by the power of mathematics, by by the uh, the heuristic, the the suggestive power of the 
of the model that said this is what is really important. And it, it was precisely because it was so abstract um, that it turned out to be so powerful. It's a very cool connection. So, and one of the things that I think is coolest about this temperature is that you're able to calculate it with just present day data. You don't have to look at written records or historical trends in how these features have evolved in languages. So can you explain like what data do you actually need to calculate the temperature of a given feature? So, so we, we use the, the World Atlas of Language Structures. Um, so that database essentially um, is a database of, of all languages, more than 2000, I think, um, um, uh, the present day languages. And it records whether features are or are not present in each of these languages, or at least that information can be um, extracted from this database. And then um, it also geolocates languages. So each language is, is associated with a point on the surface of the Earth. And then um, the quantities we looked at were sort of, um, if I focus on one particular feature, what percentage of languages has that feature? And then if I look at neighboring languages, so languages that are in sort of close proximity geographically, how often does it happen that one of these languages has the feature and the other one doesn't? And that tells you something about how clustered features appear. Um, are, they sort of, are they sort of large regions on the surface of the Earth where the, the, the feature is present um, or, or not present? Or is it sort of lots of little bits? And that tells you a bit about, um, it turns out, about um, temperature in the end. So I think my message from uh, for anyone who watches this is um, it's okay if you uh, don't know the mathematics yourself. If you have um, uh, a, a, a mate uh, or a group of friends who understand it, you can work with them uh, and talk to them and, and form a team and, and, and develop the ideas. That's what happened um, in our case. I think that's a great point that you're making there, that this collaboration really does require people with, with different skill sets coming together to, to solve a bigger problem. Um, so thank you both so much for talking with me. This has been really fascinating. And I hope everyone watching is now as excited about language and math as I am. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been our pleasure, yes. Yeah. <laughs>